بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا من سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي وقني شر نفسي وفلت لساني وان اضل او ضل او ضل او ضل لغير حق رب العالمين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته. I want to start off uh, first of all uh, by both uh, thanking Sheikh Abdullah and uh, congratulating him uh, again uh, for uh, what has proven to be uh, the beginning of hopefully something that will benefit us as a community uh, for many generations to come. Uh, and I also want to thank all of the people uh, behind the scenes. I want to thank uh, Sheikh Ismail. Uh, Ibrahim, where is he? Oh, he left? Okay, uh, I want to thank him for sort of keeping us all on the Salat al uh throughout the, uh, throughout the conference. Uh, uh, Sheikh Khalil and uh, all of the other brothers and sisters uh, uh, behind the scenes um, for taking the time out of their lives and away from their families uh, to work uh, for the benefit uh, uh, of the community. Um, this is not easy work, uh, and it's also <coughs> thankless work. Uh, and I just want to uh, express my thanks to them uh, and ask Allah to bless them all richly. Um, I also want to say that uh, just listening to that, uh, that last panel, uh, it, it, it reminded me of something. And uh, I just want to take a, just a moment uh, sort of to reflect on this uh, out loud. You know, one of the things that it reminded me of with the whole business of finance and getting our personal finances in check, et cetera, et cetera, um, is that as a community, both collectively and individually, we have to uh, remain connected to the value of discipline. Um, and there can be no control of personal finances without discipline. And in that regard, I want to make a plug for uh, us coming to a broader understanding and a deeper appreciation for the institution of Salat. And I'm not talking about Salat in terms of, I'm not talking about the purpose of Salat. The purpose of Salat is to worship and aggrandize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But among the benefits of Salat is discipline. When you keep your Salat regularly, your whole life becomes disciplined. You know, it's like, I want to go out to the mall to pick something up. The first thing I have to do is what? Got to look at my watch. Why do I have to look at my watch? Because I got to know how much time I got outside. Should I mix a lot now? Or should, do I have time to do it when I get back home? Right? I want to take a nap. I'm real sleepy, man. What I got to do? I got okay, do I have time? No, I better do it now. What I'm trying to say, Salat is one of those technologies of the self. And if we are regular with our Salat, what we will find is that we will have greater discipline in our lives. And it will creep up on us as just one of those parts of our character now. We think about everything that we do. We become natural planners, all right? And this is a part of the whole package of Islam. Allah is not joking around when he says this is a mercy to us. Because this in some ways brings us a discipline that we might not otherwise have. And that's just a lot. That ain't even counting Ramadan. That's not even counting Zakat. So I just wanted to, 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 to put that out there uh, because the state of our, our souls, the state of our, ourselves, will be the ultimate determiner of what we are able to do, both individually and collectively. And Salat is one of those institutions that, that enables us to get the most out of what Allah has given us. 
So for my closing remarks, let me um, just say this. It has become clear over, or I should say clearer, because I think it was clear when we came in here, that there are many issues that we as a community um, need to work on. We need to develop a vision about, we need to develop a, 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 a plan of attack in order to try to resolve some of these issues. We have issues of money, we have issues of culture, we have issues of gender, we have issues of, of race, we have issues of marriage, we have all kinds of issues that confront us as a community. And as we have seen over the course of this conference, sometimes in attempting to, in attempting to negotiate those issues, um, the terrain can be quite rocky. It can be often difficult for us to talk about these issues. And one of the things that I think that has come out of some of our conversations is that there is a lot of healing that we need to find a way to bring to our community. There is pain in our community. There is disappointment. There is misunderstanding. There is a sense of betrayal. And all of these things are very painful for us. And it's very difficult for us to come together and to talk about these things without exacerbating the very pain that brought us to the discussion to begin with. And yet, talk about these things and negotiate these things, we must. So how do we as a community go about the process of bringing some healing into our midst? The honest answer to this question, for me anyway, is that I don't know. I don't know in concrete terms how we as a community are going to do that. I know that there are those probably here in, in the audience who would say, well, the answer is easy. All we have to do is go back to the Quran and the Sunnah and the teachings of Islam and all of our problems will be resolved. And that's our problem. We're not holding by the Quran and the Sunnah. Um, <coughs> I want to submit to you, however, that I don't think anybody who comes here to represent a particular position thinks that their position is not based on Quran and Sunnah. Everybody thinks their position is based on Quran and Sunnah. Nobody comes and says, I don't care what Quran and Sunnah says. I don't care what it says. It's my position. Nobody says that. <laughs> Everybody thinks that their, their position is right. It's based on Quran and Sunnah. And so what we have to learn how to do is we have to learn how to talk about these things. And by the way, when we come here, I want to make this clear. There are some issues that are clear cut in Islam. Not everything is a matter of discussion. We have things in Islam on which there is a unanimous consensus, always has been for over a millennium, and they're just not open for discussion. I'm not having a conversation with you about a ham sandwich. I'm not going to do it. We're not discussing that. That's one of those, we're not talking about Zina, we're not talking about whether you can get high, we're not having those kinds of conversations. And yet, beyond those things upon which there is this unanimous consensus, there are many issues that are still open to discussion and exchange. Some of those issues weren't even around at the time that these unanimous consensuses were reached. And so we have much to discuss among us as a community. And our, our, our challenge is, how do we find ways of discussing these issues such that those discussions are more likely to bring healing to our community rather than to tear our community apart? We want people to come into a hall like this and discuss these, these issues and discuss them robustly and honestly and courageously. But we don't want people to go out of this building saying, 
I ain't going back there no more. That's what we don't want. So how do we get there? I think it is critical that we learn not simply how to talk to each other. I think that this blessed conference has taught us the value of being able to talk to each other. But I think it's even more important that we learn what the purpose of talking to each other is. What is the ultimate goal of talking to each other? Because if we're not clear about this point, then talking to each other can actually make the situation what? Can actually make the situation worse. And so what I want to spend a little time that I have, and I know that people are expecting me to go over time, but I'm not. <laughs> I want to try to resurrect an aspect of the traditional civilization of Islam that made that civilization great, and great as a religious civilization. We don't realize this. Part of what made Islam great as a religious civilization was that Islam among all the religious civilizations, found a way to accommodate genuine pluralism. You follow what I'm talking about? I had a, a professor in college, all right? And he taught Islamic studies. He was a Catholic. And he taught the students in class one day. He said, this was the civilization of Islam. You could be a Maliki or a Shafi'i. We're talking about Sunnism here. We can get to the others later. We, well, <laughs> and another time. Uh, you could be a Hanbali. You could be a Hanafi. All of those were mutually recognized as being equally orthodox, equally authoritative. He said, you didn't have this in any other religious civilization. Why did you have the wars of religion in the West? It's because they could not accommodate a religious pluralism. And he said, the West was not able to establish a pluralism until they marginalized religion. Islam was able to do it with religion at the center of its civilization. That's where we come from. But that's a part of what we've lost. We have to begin again to understand that we have a concept in Islam. It's called the concept of khilaf. It is justifiable disagreement. It's not disagreement just because I'm disagreeable. It is justifiable disagreement. And the important takeaway from this is the following, because this is what makes our conversation so difficult. If I go into the conversation understanding that there is the possibility of multiple justifiable points of view, then the point of the conversation is to learn what those justifiable points of view are and to separate those from those points of view that are not justifiable. Does everybody understand my point about that? But if I don't have that mentality, then I go into the conversation on the understanding that there is one right view. And I listen to everybody in terms of what? Are you saying that which will confirm my view? If you are, then I will accept you. If you're not, I gotta kill you. I have to destroy your point of view. Why? because that's the only way mine can stand. And you can see what this does to us as a community. I can't even listen to you. I can't even listen to you. Because if you even sound like you're going in a direction that threatens the point of view, 
that I'm inclined towards. All right? I'm going to shut you down. Either by shouting you down or by psychologically blocking you up. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Right? I mean, it's like, I hate to say this, you, you get into an argument with your wife or your husband. You ain't listening to that. You pretend to listen. I'm shocked at myself. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for the holes. I ain't trying to understand nothing. Because I got a position I want to defend. And I'm breaking out the gaps. And as soon as she's done, what? Who? And the whole time she's speaking, or the whole time he's speaking, you ain't got nothing up but defense mechanism. This is what we have to get away from, brothers and sisters. And this is why it's so important for us, on the very fundamental level, to get back to a basic religious literacy in our community. There are many things, as I said, that there's no discussion on. But look at all of the issues that have been raised in this conference. What is the best way to create wealth in our community? There's going to be one point of view about that. And even if there is one point of view, because at some point, we got to make a decision. How are we going to arrive at that? We're going to have to have the kinds of discussions that will enable us to come up top with the very best point of view. And that means a willingness to listen and give and take. We have to have this. Otherwise, my fear is that we will become our own worst enemies. And that whole business I talked about of finding Muslims that you like as well as that you love, that will become much less likely because you can't even talk to them. You can't even talk to them. I mean, when we have this kind of literacy, it's, it's so nice. Uh, many of you might not realize this. I, I, I prayed uh, uh, Salat the Lord today. And uh, I noticed, I think you remember, uh, what's his name, Dawood, he's gone now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, da yeah, Dawood. Uh, Dawood led the Salat. And uh, uh, they said to him, he, he, he uh, prayed two rakahs. Uh, and they said to him, uh, okay, uh, come and lead the, uh, the prayer for us. So Dawood told them, no, 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 you, you, you guys go ahead, all right? And so the brother uh, uh, came up and uh, led the salah for, for Asa, okay? I prayed Asa with them. Now, Dawood didn't pray Asa with them because that's the Maddie school. That's the dominant view in the Maddie school. Do I follow what I'm, I'm, I'm saying so far? All right? They don't pray, but Qasim, not jump. They don't join, okay? All right? That's my minority opinion. In the Maddie school, if not the bottom, call the Abdul Wahab. We don't have to get into that. Trust me, I just, I, I know what I'm talking about, all right? <laughs> so, 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 no, 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 no. So, <laughs> So, so what I'm saying, I saw him, I think he saw me. Do we have any rank out <laughs> And this is Salah. Is that right, follow what I'm talking about? This is Salah. All right? We can't come in and discuss gender. We can't come in and discuss race. We can't come in and discuss culture. Not if the very mentality is, I got my point of view, I don't want to hear nobody, except nobody, except those people who are going to confirm my point of view. Everybody else, they got to go. A stop the law. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not joking about this. This is serious. This is serious. Because what we don't realize, let me, let me share a little something to you, with you. You know, I've been a Muslim like, like over 40 years. I was five years old when I. <laughs> My girl. So, I, you know, 
I watch movies like I'm always thinking about Islam. You, you know what I mean? I mean, I, I, I went to uh, what is it? Uh, Terminator Two. Oh, that's right. Muslims don't watch movies. I'm sorry. But uh, I went to Terminator Two. I'm sitting up in the movie theater. Terminator Two. You know what that movie was, right? This is an action movie. I'm sitting up in the movie crying. <laughs> I'm looking at this woman, right? She knows what's coming. They don't know. She's trying to save them. And I'm saying, what? That's him. There he is. You know what I'm talking about. That's him. No, really, I start crying. You care more about your own people than they're able to care about themselves and they reject you. Right? But that's not the movie I want to talk about now. I'm talking the other movie. I just want to let you know how I watch movies so you don't think I'm up here tripping. <laughs> There's a movie called Jimmy Hoffa. You, Hoffa, you know, you, you, you know that movie? There's a scene in that movie, man. It, it really taught me something. Jimmy Hoffa, you know, he was this uh, uh, labor leader. And back at that time, things had to be done in secret. So there was one dude that was working with them. They didn't really trust him, right? So the dude, and they were having a secret meeting. So the dude asked Jimmy Hoffa, where's the meeting gonna be? And Jimmy Hoffa tells him where the meeting's gonna be, right? It's a secret meeting. So Danny DeVito, who is Jimmy Hoffa's sidekick, after the dude turns around and leaves, he says, what are you doing? Why did you tell him where the meeting is? Right? Jimmy Hoffa says to him this, and, and this is relevant to what we're talking about here. He says, listen to me. Ordinary disagreements can be resolved. Conflicts of interest can be resolved. Because if people are really honest, they understand that he just wants his interest just like I want mine. But an imaginary hate, a perceived slight, a symbolic put down, that motor smacker will hate your guts to the day he dies. Do you understand what I'm talking about? That's what we're constantly doing to each other. Do you understand what I'm talking about? And because of that, we got all this internal bleeding. And internal bleeding is worse than external wounds. Why? Because you can't see it. You can't see it. And the only cure for this, and I'm not saying this as some, you know, th this is not just pragmatics. This is Islam. This is Islam. It goes all the way back to the Prophet Muhammad himself, so the Lord, he was said. Very famous story at the time in the Prophet. Omar, heard one of the Sahaba reciting for him. And I'm not saying, what you talk about Wallace? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the recitation as Omar had learned. So he took the man and took him to the prophet. <coughs> and he said, this man is misreciting Quran. And the prophet said, okay, recite what he recited, Omar. Omar recited it. Okay, now you recite it. And he recited it, just like he recited it before. The prophet said, both of these are correct. Yo. This is a different presentation. Some of you don't know. If some of you in this hall right now heard some of the brothers recite some wash, you might say the same thing. You understand what I'm talking about? There are more than one recitation of Quran. More than one recitation of what? No, 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 no. Of what? Quran. And we can't talk about gender? And we can't talk about race. We can't differ on gender. We can't differ on race. We can't differ on culture. And I'm not talking about any wild, crazy opinions. I, I said the laugh is what? Justifiable disagreement. <coughs> but understand what I mean by that? And it's because I like, because I feel. This is justifiable agreement. All right? Disagreement, I'm sorry. And so there is such a thing as disagreement in Islam. And that's a part of who we are as Muslims. 
That's our legacy. All right? And right now, if the world, especially our country, needs anything, is to learn how to be a genuinely pluralistic society. Not a fake pluralism. What's a fake pluralism? A fake pluralism is, yes, you have the right to be like me. <laughs> and so there are really multiple expressions of me. You, you follow what I mean by that? That's a fake pluralism. What we need is a genuine pluralism. All right? And there, there are many aspects that I could go into, but people start getting nervous that they think I'm going to go on, so I'm, 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 going, to, I'm going to cut this short. So I, 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 I want us as a community to understand this. And there is another aspect to this that I think is important for us to understand. We have to understand the nature of our disagreement. Because there's one, there's more than one form of disagreement. Sometimes the disagreement is over an interpretation of scripture. You think the ayah or the hadith means this? I think the ayah or the hadith means that. All right? And we have to present our evidence as to why my interpretation of the ayah is a plausibly justifiable interpretation, and you do the same thing. And it's like magic. You know, when people are not trying to force something on you, you find yourself a lot more open to what they have to say. You see what I'm saying? When we start off with our conversation is about plausible disagreement, then I'm open to what you say. And you might actually win me over, or I might win you over. But we have to be careful about not just smushing all disagreement together. Because the disagreement might not have anything to do with our interpretation of Quran and Sunnah. The disagreement may be over the interpretation of factual reality. Do I understand what I mean by that? Let me give you, because everybody's falling asleep, let me wake them up. Let me, let me give you a concrete example of, of of, of what I'm talking about. Uh, and by the way, this is just an example. This is what? <laughs> no, no, it's not work. This, this is just an example, all right? Uh, this is for educational purposes. <laughs> Pedagogical interest here. If the question comes up, can you vote for Trump? What's the answer? <laughs> See? See? We got some good students here. Because students always change the fact pattern. I said what? Can you vote for him or not? Is it permissible to vote for him or not? I'm not hearing you. Yes. Yes. That issue that comes up in the community, you see what I'm saying? And that's fine. No, no, no. No, no, no. This is what I'm trying to get at. If I say no, what do I mean by that? Do I mean that Allah and his messenger said no? Or do I mean that as a factual matter, that is going to be so harmful to the Muslims that you should not vote for him? Do I understand what I mean by that? Yeah. But that second one, that's a matter of your assessment. Do you understand what I mean by that? I might have a different assessment of that. Does it mean that I don't accept Quran and Sunnah? It got nothing to do with that. Somebody understand what I'm talking about? I said this is pedagogical, so relax, everybody. <laughs> no, but I'm very serious. This is the kind of stuff that tears us apart. Because, because we, we go away. Man, Kevin ain't got no man. He ain't a real Muslim. It's got nothing to do with rejecting Quran or Sunnah. Nothing at all. It's a matter of, okay, there are some factual realities here that we as Muslims must consider. And based on that consideration, we should not vote for them. Or someone else may have another point of view that we should. 
But you understand the difference between the two. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about? Yes. We have to be very careful about that. Because if he differs with me, or she differs with me on the second one, what does that say about their level of commitment to what Adam said? Huh? If he disagrees or she disagrees with me on the second one, the factual assessment, what does it have to say about that level of commitment to Quran and Sunnah? <laughs> Nothing. What binds us as Muslims? Our commitment to Quran and Sunnah. So even though he disagrees with me, or she disagrees with me on the second one, I still must acknowledge him and her, her, her as my brother and sister. Do I understand what I'm talking about? We have to learn how to accommodate these differences. And we can't come in here listening to people speak and expecting to find only the opinion that we want to hear and everything else has to go. That's not why Allah put all the talent and all the experience and all the expertise and all the genius in this community. He put it there so that we can harness it. And so that we can harness it in order to pursue his pleasure. This is something that has occurred to me time and time again uh, throughout, throughout this conference. And, then, and, and now I want to say something, something else. Because healing, you see, it's hard for healing to take place where some in our community feel that they're not even being heard. But when we have this zero-sum mentality, how can you hear anybody? You understand what I mean by that? Right? And this is part of why we have to, to come back to an Islamic civics. We've adopted the civics of the dominant culture around us. Don't believe me? I heard Charles Barkley once said, they asked him, you know, because Charles Barkley is very popular in the, you know, in the popular... <coughs> I'm sorry? Wait a minute, I'm from Philly. Well, it's my favorite. Uh, you, know, you ain't telling me that. <laughs> no, no, he's very popular in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the popular culture. Someone asked him in an interview once, would you ever think about, think about running for political office? He said no. Because they were saying that you, you could very easily win. He said no. Why? Barkley said this. He said, listen, man, I could probably sit with the leader of the KKK and find something in common. <laughs> in Washington, D.C. today, you can't find anything in common. Everything is zero sum. <clears throat> Everything is my way or the highway. And we as Muslims have adopted the same culture. You see it all the time. There's never any allowance that there might be more than one plausible disagreement on this issue. So-and-so is always absolutely right or absolutely wrong. We've got to get away from this. Because that mentality will stifle us in our attempts to grow in any of these areas that we're talking about. How can we talk about gender? How can we talk about race? Well, I, I'm going to impose my view on y'all. You're going to impose yours on me? How can we talk about culture? This is what we have to get. This is what we have to get back to. And I think that one of the things that concerns me very deeply is that, is that those of religious knowledge have to be aware of this as well. And they have to be aware of the distinction between the two things that I talked about. One is a matter of scriptural interpretation. The other is a reading of reality. And with regard to the reading of reality, there may be many people in this room, just like the people who are up here talking about finance, who know much more than the religious God. Does everybody follow what I'm talking about? And those people have to be recognized for the authority that their expertise confers upon them. And the religious scholars cannot attempt to shut that conversation down. 
Their job is to establish the parameters. And when that conversation bumps up on this parameter, the religious scholar says what? You're bumping up. Bumps on that, you're bumping up. But within this, what does the religious scholar have to say? Do your thing and come up with the best for the community. If this distinction is not observed, I'm not saying this to try to, to pander to those who are not religious scholars. In fact, I'm saying this in defense of religious scholarship. Because one of my fears, and I see it afoot already, is that if this distinction that I talked about is not maintained, then the people will come to resent religious scholarship. And when that happens, they will start seeking other foundations upon which to base their lives, even as Muslims. That will happen, and it's already begun happening. And that is a disaster. It's a disaster. So I hope that we will be able to, to establish a Muslim civics that enables us to come in and discuss our issues in a successful manner. Now this is a tall, a tall order. I just got two short things to say and I'm done, I'm out of here. I'm actually still in the time, but anyway. <laughs> this is a tall order. You know, whenever, whenever these kinds of things come up, people wonder, well, how do we do that? H how do we do that? I mean, the, the answer is, again, the honest answer is, I don't know. And that's not a cop out. That's like asking me, how do you stay married? Who, who in here can tell me how you stay married? Wait a minute, y'all ain't married? <laughs> <laughs> this is a room full of bachelors, bachelorettes? How do you stay married? A lot. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yes. No, no. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, I'm not, I'm not. I can't tell you that. I don't know. No, no, you understand what I mean by that? It's, a, it's like when Michael Jordan gets the ball, he don't know what he's going to do with it. Does he? Oh, it's, it's the wrong crowd. Y'all know? <laughs> Y'all know Michael Jordan? Y'all don't even believe me. Y'all 
would not believe. Before I was a Muslim, I was the disco king. <laughs>
is not synonymous with violence. You don't believe me? It's not synonymous with violence. Not long ago, I think it was two years ago, you had a sitting United States Senator who took some stupid pictures of a female. As a result of which, what happened? He was booted out of office. Women's movements had gained enough power to unseat a United States Senate. You, you hear what I'm talking about? Right? We have to acquire power as well, but we will never have any power until we have some unity. We will never have any power until we have some unity. And part of what I've been trying to establish here is that unity is not the same as uniformity. That's what so many of us keep trying to do. Unity is not the same as uniformity. So in closing, I ask Allah to guide us and to strengthen us to be able to carry the mantle of our beloved Prophet and to remember all that those people who came before us sacrificed so that this religion could live. To think about what they gave up. To think about how hard they worked. And to think of ourselves as the heirs to that legacy. May Allah bless us to be able to carry, to carry this legacy in such a way that we hand on to posterity something with which they will be able to build that they will be able to then pass on to posterity so that when we meet Allah on the day of judgment, we can stand tall and at least say, at least say, Wallahi Allah, I did my best. At least say that. Because at the end of the day, we're not responsible for the success. <coughs> we're responsible for the effort. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us to be able to make that effort, to heal our, our hearts, to, 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 to remove the rancor from, from, from within our midst, to remove the misunderstanding that we may have of each other, to strengthen us to be able to listen to each other and actually hear one another. And to understand, to understand that this Islam is big enough for us all. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum.